Well, good morning, everyone. This is August the 9th, Freiburg New Church Assembly, first hour lecture. And the title of this uh, thought and meditation we're going to consider today is Thou Shalt Not Lie. Now, uh, as I, again, yesterday I said one of the things a speaker usually likes to do is to get his thoughts and his ideas organized in such a way that's like a golden thread which each thing is tied together so that we get the whole picture. So again, I want to start out with the idea you and me working together to form that golden thread. So where do we begin? Well, today's commandment is the eighth commandment. And if you look at the number eight, it's a seven and a one. It's a holiness. That's what seven is representative of. One represents the Lord. And so this commandment that we're going to consider is a holy thing when we focus on the Lord. So that's our beginning golden thread. This is not an accidental or a coincidental uh, uh, commandment. It is of vital importance. And so I want us to have this feeling of thou shalt not lie is a conjunction that is with the Lord. Now, in this golden thread, how many of you have ever served on jury duty? Okay. Have any of you served as a witness in a jury? Well, you have been there. Now, what is one of the things a witness has to do when they're called on to testify? What? Yes, sir. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. I, now, would you just close your eyes for a minute, if you feel it that way, and put your hand up in... in to, towards the Lord and say with me the following words I promise, I promise to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth nothing but the truth so help me God so help me God isn't that a wonderful way to begin? I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. In other words, I like that last phrase because it indicates I'm a human being. I have a tendency to make mistakes. I have a tendency sometimes to overstate something or understate something if I'm feeling a little guilty. So you and I daily are, are combating this thing about, I want to tell the truth. And we are a people who want to have our facts straight. I, I don't want to be, uh, the Jewish have a word, spindel, I mean the Germans have a word, spindelkopf. It's a favorite of mine. It means this head of mine is spinning around, spindelkopf. And I'm trying to sort things out. The Jewish people have a word called meshugana. You know, anybody know what meshugana means? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, I'm a... Now, that's not a put-down. It's just talking about the fact that we are a people constantly on search for finding that wonderful golden path called telling the truth. But there are... Uh, I, I have a, 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 a kind of a feeling that truth is elusive for us. And what is a fact today might not be a fact tomorrow. Now, how many of you grew up with the silliness of being told about a time in an age where they thought the world was flat? You went just so far and down, and they were afraid to go to sea until somebody did what? They traveled and found another country, brought back treasure to show, and that myth, that myth of ignorance was overcome. When I was a boy in science class, and this is back in the 40s, uh, our teacher went up to the board and put on the board, we will never land on the moon. <laughs> and he had his facts. Here's the plane. 
Here's the plane that can only have this much gas in it. The distance from Earth to the moon, they, there's not enough gas to make it. And our planes can't go fast enough to break through what? The sound barrier. The what? The sound barrier. Well, the or, or the yes, atmosphere. break out of the atmosphere. that atmospheric pressure. So he had all his facts together, went to the board, and I'm a little kid say, yeah, I guess he's right. Uh, we heard somebody say Bannister, when he was running, was told no one will ever break the mile in what? Four minutes. Four minutes. He did. Since that time, what did somebody say? There are over 20 people now that have broke. I mean, you know, we grew up with the ignorance and the errors of the ignorance. Now, the thing I like about it is the writings say the following thing. That which is done in innocence, we're not held culpable for. And the Lord knows that we have many moments where we're in ignorance, and that ignorance causes us to make mistakes. How many of you have ever had a friend walk up and say, Ray, what do you think of this shirt? Well, now, say, let's say you don't really like it. What do you do for me? Say Hey, Ray, what do you think of my shirt? It looks great, George. Yeah, okay. Even though it doesn't look great, you're going to be kind and loving to me. So you're going to tell what kind of a lie? White lie. A white lie. Anybody ever tell a white lie and, and say, I wish I could have said, that tie really doesn't match the rest of your outfit. My kids have a little thing. If I get, now Lois is good, she buys my clothes and I, she gets them to kind of match. But once in a while, I mix up the match and my kids will come and say, or Lois will say, uh, Dad, honey, you've introduced another color. <laughs> and I immediately know I messed up on the color. But, you know, we have these things. So white lies, kindly lies, and then there are black lies. So what the Lord is talking about in this commandment is he's trying to steer us away from the black lies. Now, the writings talk about the lies of ignorance. We're going we're gonna to point to it. So, uh, our talk today is not so much about the lies of ignorance, unless that ignorance is done with intent. But if I make a mistake, I don't want to, I shouldn't go around self-flagellating. Realize I made that mistake, that error that I passed on out of ignorance. But my life is, Every day the Lord comes in mercy and compassion to help me find a new beginning. I love that. That's in the book of Lamentations, if any of you want to look up that thing. Every day the Lord's mercy and grace is new. So even though I make the mistake, even though I may have passed on a falsehood, if I didn't do it with the intent of doing something to get even or to hurt somebody. Uh, I liked Dr. Obner. Now, he was a teacher in the academy many years ago, and he said, truth is like this. It's like an ice cube, cold facts, and you can put the ice cube on the table, but the room temperature is gonna do what to that ice cube? Melted, it's gonna be a puddle of water. So he said, truth is something that we have to every day go and search for and also trying to improve and get us over the innocence or the lies of, of innocence. The lies of ignorance have to be uh, uh, corrected and set aside. So uh, here we are trying to do our very best. Now we need to know that we have an enemy that wants to keep us in darkness. It's hell. How many of you have ever read what hell is like? I mean, as far as their living conditions and as far as what they deal with. I, I love some. Okay, so what, what one do you remember that about their existence? Oh, you were going to say something else. Okay. No, no, but just that the, there's a beautiful picture of uh, a painting of hell where everyone is starving and emaciated at this beautiful, bountiful table, and then there's another table that's heaven, 
and they're all happy and having a wonderful party because in hell, they're all trying to feed themselves with these large spoons and they can't reach their mouths, but in heaven, they're feeding each other. Great. I was going to use that example because that's one that meant a lot. You picture now, everybody's hands are this way. And in hell, they're trying to feed themselves and the elbow doesn't bend. And so they're standing in the midst of plenty as starving. Whereas those that are in heaven, their arms are like this and they take food and they're feeding each other. I also love the, uh, the fact that it says hell is a place of not getting the facts straight. There's this guy in the cave and he's got all this glittering stuff around him and he's counting his gold. But what kind of gold was it? Do you remember? Fool's gold. Fool's gold. Worthless. It looked sparkly, it looked shiny, but it wasn't worth anything. There were those in hell who thought they were the most clever, the most brilliant people, that are, and they were there writing books. And as fast as they wrote words, the words did what? Disappeared. Disappeared. What a frustration that is. You think you're authoring uh, the world's greatest book, you're writing, and as fast as you write, the words disappear. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they're in a cave writing these things out, their words are disappearing, and what about the candles? The candles keep going out. They have to keep lighting. I mean, I, I, I feel... And, and they think they're living in a magnificent palace when in fact they're in a cave it's dingy, dark, and they step outside and they're walking in quicksand. Now, I don't say that to scare anybody, but these people want to come and mess with us about the truth. And, and so uh, we need to know that every day hell's going to try to give us a dark falsity and is going to try to inspire us to do the following things. A black lie can conceals intent of wanting to bear a false report. Hell wants us to think about hypocrisy, plots, premeditated evils, hatred, revenge, and concealment. That's hell's agenda. I need to know that because the Lord's agenda is light, freedom, understanding. And I think what I'm trying to set uh, uh, this, this little golden thread. The Lord is trying to tell us some good information. You've got people, spirits, and spheres around you that are going to try to get you to delve in the dark lies. The Lord's going to excuse us if we make a, li a lie out of ignorance. So we've got to learn to deal with, with this. And uh, So hell also has as it age its agenda is to pers uh, persuade us that that which is true is false and that which is false is true. That's their game plan. And so that having us close our eyes and put our hand up to say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help me, God. And, and I, I just, you know, I feel very close to the Lord by saying that. I want the Lord to come and take me by the hand. And also, one of my favorite passages in, in the scripture, I get sort of sentimental about it. You remember the time that the Lord was teaching and parents came bringing their children and the, the disciples tried to do what? Shush the children away. And the Lord said, Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he took them up in his arms and kissed them and touched them. Now, I can't help but still feel that. I want to be like one of those little children, I'm talking about spiritually, where the Lord takes me up in his arms and his lap, and he touches me, and he gives me a little kiss and says, Go on, George. You know. I'm going to be with you. I like the picture of the Lord where we're out for a walk. And as we're walking along, I have the Lord's hand, he has mine. How many of you love that poem about the two footprints in the sand? I mean, isn't that a touching thing where I looked and 
I thought you were with me, Lord. There were only two, two steps. And, and that phrase, you know, I picked you up and I carried you. Uh, I mean, I, I want that. Uh, it's not sentimentalism. I want it because I think the Lord fortifies me and puts in my heart that love to tell the truth every day. I want to tell the whole truth. I don't want to be a deceiver. I don't want to be a plotter. I don't want to be somebody that's always looking, how can I get revenge? So, you know, this is a wonderful commandment. So the natural sense of this parable, or this teaching, is we need to have in our heart <coughs> getting new facts every day. I don't care if it's just a short verse that you read in the Word, the church teachings, whether it's a paragraph, every day take a walk with the Lord saying, show me that gem that's in the street that I can pick up and that I can share with myself, my family, and my friends. Do any of you ever get the feeling of excitement about being with people and you want to share something with them? You guys wrote two books. What was the purpose of your books? To make money? Share. Share. To, to uh, let people hear what the young people are going through and what ways they're dealing with the crisis. It was not for self-aggrandizement. It was a sharing. The Lord's the best sharer. Every day he gives us compassion and understanding that's new. And it's not a lie. The Lord doesn't deal with white lies, black lies. He deals with truth. And so on this, on this the natural level, the Lord is saying try to be a truth teller. I want to put my hand up. Anybody want to? I don't even want to look at anybody. I want to be a truth teller. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of the games. And I'm tired of the false pretense. I want to be open to the Lord. And I want to be open with my friends. So that's the natural. The spiritual one, let's just read that together in case you uh, have your book of true Christian religion with you. Let's, I'll, I'll read and you listen and you think about it. In the spiritual sense, bearing false witness means to be persuaded that a falsity belief is a true belief and that the evil of life is the good of life and the reverse. Now, what I liked about the, the, the lesson that we learned today uh, about Noah becoming drunk and naked in the tent. Ham, I, it, although the word doesn't say, I think he enjoyed the fact of seeing his old man drunk and naked and, and probably was gigging a little bit and he couldn't wait to get to tell his two brothers, hey, come and see dad, you know. And, and I just love Sh uh, Sham and Japheth. Uh, instead of looking at it, turned their back with a cloth and covered their father. And then that lesson that we had, it is not angelic to point at somebody's faults unless at the same time you're willing to point at their good points. Uh, to me, that's spiritual. That's telling the truth. Okay, so you've got some faults. We all have them. We've all told our white lies. We all have told our lies of ignorance. But if we diligently say to the Lord, help make me a truth teller. I, I love this commandment. What about you? Is it encouraging? Is it something that we can say, okay, I don't want to live in the bogs, the quicksand. I don't want my gold that I'm counting to be fool's gold. I don't want my candle going out. I don't want my words. I want to be true to the Lord and true to my friends. So I stand before you today trying to be an inspirer. Let's get the golden thread. The Lord is trying to get us to connect. And do you know what it says about the Ten Commandments? They are the complex. And I want to read that quote because it's, it's so wonderful. It's in the Doctrine of Light. The Ten Commandments are a brief summary, a complex of all those things of religion by means of which the Ten Commandments help us to have a conjunction with the Lord. That's good news. That's not uh, uh, 
sorrowful noise. That's good news. He wants us to have a conjunction with him. The things in the Ten Commandments are so holy that there is nothing more elsewhere. So I, I feel sad when I hear about a town or, or, or a state where they, they give a decree to go and take the Ten Commandments off the wall. Any of you come from an area where the Ten Commandments were removed? So if it's removed, it's more the, the reason that you and I need to establish these Ten Commandments in our lives. Okay, so they took them down off that out of us, but they ain't going to take them from inside my heart. Mm -hmm. And, and I, just, I just think this is what uh, this is all about. This is what I think our talk today is. And by golly, I want this word. Remember that I told you it was my favorite, where the angels walked in and touched this scripture, and their hands glowed. Their clothes touched this scripture, and their clothes grow. And the one that I love is where my face begins to glow. This is powerful stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This is not Sunday school stuff. This is living stuff. And so I say this with great enthusiasm. I love the Ten Commandments. I do not want hell trying to remove them from edifices, from things. So that the spiritual sense, that just read a little bit more. The spiritual sense of this commandment is for the purpose that we not remain in ignorance. Isn't that nice? The purpose of the Ten Commandments is that we become enlightened. And uh, so that the learned can know what is true and what is good. And then I like this phrase, because the Lord says so. You know what? The Lord, it's true because... Not because you said it, or I said it, because the Lord said it. So, uh, you know, that conviction, I, I like that. So, um, so, in the word, there is a falsehood which is called a lie, which is an intent to be deceitful. So, uh, the Lord is saying, I want you to be my child. I want you to be spontaneous. I want you to be, you know, bubbly. I don't want you to be, whoa, whoa, whoa life is, yeah. no, the Lord wants to give us, if you don't tell lies, he wants to give us that joy and balance in our step, and to take us up in his lap, touch us and kiss us. I, I, I don't think that's too much to, to uh, I just feel the love for that. And, uh, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I did love singing that song, Jesus Loves Me. And can any of you join me on that? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so got to have that. Now on the celestial level we hear the following thing. In the celestial sense bearing false witness means blasphemy for the Lord and his word. I want to stop right there. Do you remember that story about when Noah woke up and he knew what Ham had done he put a curse on Ham. Do you remember that? What was the curse that he put on Ham? Send him to Canaan. He should be a servant. He should be a servant. Do you know in the uh, time of the conflict of the uh, Civil War that there were those who justified slavery according to this passage? They said they went and looked at Ham and his people and where they were born and Hamites were of dark skin. Therefore, slavery was approved by the Lord, and slavery was indeed not a disorder, because the Lord, Lord never makes laws and decrees. So all the Hamites, black people, should be servants. Is that a sad thing? To, to say that the Lord, decree, the Lord didn't decree it, it was 
those who went to find reasons to justify slavery. I, I feel sad about the fact that people, anybody know of another, I mean, that's one example, there are others. Anybody know of another example where scripture was turned, twisted, so that that which is true is made to look false, and that which is false is made to look true? Anybody have a good example? Yes, right. Servants, obey your masters. Okay, so continuing with the... There Therefore, servants should do anything their masters say. Therefore, slaves should be obedient to slaveholders. Okay. So it's somewhat similar to the Hamite uh, condemnation. Yes, Sage. I'm interpreting in Leviticus that a man should not lie with a young boy, that that has anything to do with gay marriage. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, uh, the Hamites were Amorites. And the Amorites were these tribes people that were the giants, the biblical giants, and they all had to be slaughtered. They were slaughtered by the Ammonites, who were the descendants of Lot, who also had to be destroyed because they were the offspring of incest. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a story after this meeting about okay. Ham. So, so this commandment that we're looking at is saying, read the scriptures, seek that which is true, don't try to take that which is true and make it false, and don't try to take what is false to make it look like it's true. I mean, we, I think we've all experienced this kind of thing. Where, uh, why'd you do that? I mean, I, that, I, I'd always have this little brain running to think why I could say, boy, how many times do, do your kids get arguing and they say, he made me do it, she made me do it. You know, we're always trying to turn the tale that we didn't, do the thing. Uh, who was it that told the story? Oh, Martha love, told the story. Uh, uh, her son came home with a piece of candy from Solari's that he didn't buy. And he says, Mom, may I buy this candy? He brought it home. And she took him right back to return the thing. There used to be a, a group of stores. Are they still up here in New England? It was, uh, everything was a quarter. Uh, now, uh, what was the name of that? So there, there's nine. stores that Woolworth. Woolworth. Five and nine. Woolworth. Five and nine. Woolworth. Yes, but there was a, it was store number one, and then one was store number two, and it, it started coming. Oh, it was a great. You'd walk in. I'll never forget. It was in Westwood. We had one near us. You'd walk in, and they'd have this big vat of balloons, and people. And the rule was, you could put your hand in, and as many as you could get in that handful was 25 cents. Well, on the way from that vat, you would drop some and they'd be all over the floor, people walking on them. And, and I remember the thought coming into my mind, well, wait a minute, all those balloons on the floor people are stepping on, you know, why don't I take a few and take another handful? You know, do you remember thoughts like that going through your head? Uh, somebody said they went into their mom's purse and took 50 cents and felt at any moment somebody was gonna say, you took 50 cents from mom's purse. Uh, I remember my grandmother, who brought me up, had this uh, crystal bowl where she would always take her extra change and put it in. And I'd look at it, and the old temptation was take some of that. And I'd go, and I'd put my hand in, and I'd try to be so careful because I didn't want any coins dropping and clinking against the crystal. And, uh, you know, the deceit that was going on as a little kid, to go to, to the penny candy store with a quarter. Yeah. But we, we have these things, but I do remember that uh, my Sunday school background helped me a lot. Thou shalt not. And so what I uh, had at the beginning of the class, us close our eyes and say, I will tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. I, I really, really do want the Lord's help. So I, I'm happy to have this as a topic for my presentation because I want to help us to get that feeling of the Lord is trying to get us out of our schwindelkopf, out, out of our meshuggah state, and to get us walking hand in hand with him. So we want to pay attention to this commandment from, from the natural sense, from the spiritual sense, and from the celestial sense.
So I hope in some way I've been able to organize some of our thinking about this commandment. Eight. It's a seven and it's a one. Seven is holiness. One is God. So the two together make the eight. So we're, to, to keep this commandment, I, I, I just offer. Now, some of you may or may not have gotten one of these. And if, if, if this has inspired you, I think I have an extra one here or there. I'd be happy to share with you if you hadn't gotten one of these. Mm -hmm. All right, I open the, the floor. I hope I've done something in the way of being inspirational to get us thinking about why is this commandment, along with the other ones, such an integral part of our life? And I'm going to close with this. Because George McCurdy said this, because the Lord said this. That's the purpose of our studying the Ten Commandments. It is the complex of everything that's embodied in religion. So friends, thank you for listening. Thank you from my look at you and seeing you're being supportive. And I send love to you. And I want to share that quote once more from Lamentation. Every day, the Lord is merciful and compassionate. Every day. So we may tell that little white lie. We may have that lie of ignorance. But the Lord's there to say, okay, come sit on my lap. I want to hold you and I want to teach you. Thank you. Anything. <laughs> Comments, please. Yes, Sage. Um, I like your bringing out the numerology of eight being seven and one, because I went, as I was listening to you speak, it definitely feels like um, thou shalt not lie and bear false witness has a lot to do with creating idols, which is that first commandment. Yeah. So thank you. It's a nice connection. Suzanne? Well, one of the things about lying Susanna Furry, um, is that I think we need to look at lying to ourselves, not just lying to others. And if our goal in this life is to become as much of an angelic self as we can, one of the things we need to be prepared for in the next life is we will be totally revealed. It, there, you won't have a chance to lie about who you are. So if you can become authentic in this life, and deal with those little lies you tell yourself about, oh, I'm really being kind when actually you are not, or I'm really uh, wanting the best for another person and really you're wanting the best for yourself. Any way in which you are, you can lie to yourself about any of the commandments about what you're really intending. And now's the time to work this out. And the reason is, is and I mentioned this to Ray yesterday, we have the, the gift of free will. We have the gift of rationality. And in this life, we have the gift of the privacy of our own minds. We don't get that in the next world. So it's a really good idea to work out those lies and get authentic now. Ray? Uh, Ray Silverman, and I'm a proud member of the Polar Bear Club. <laughs> Thank you. Polar Bear, Polar Bear. Yeah. He's on so, the outreach committee. <laughs> I appointed myself in charge of outreach, and so far I have been successful. I have recruited one person <laughs> right there. <laughs> so um, I'm just glad you're not off topic. Or <laughs> <laughs> this is this is on topic, and I'll show you why. So I thought it'd be really nice to take the, the polar bear plunge, you know, into the cold river. Um, but that, that was. Word. That was before. <laughs> that was the the oh, excuse me, into the exhilarating river. <laughs> and, uh, but that was before. That was during the day. Then the next morning, when I woke up, all these rationalizations and justifications <laughs> came into my mind. False witness, because I made up my mind I'm going to take the plunge. But the next morning was, you don't want to. It's too cold. You will uh, maybe catch a cold. All these crazy things came in, and I had to put those false witnesses aside to take the plunge and be a true polar bear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Ken Wolfenden. I just wanted to touch on what Sage was saying about the, it connects with the creating idols, and I just my mind keeps going back to all these television preachers that are out there, you know, saying God needs us to have a new jet so that we can spread the word and all this stuff, and and 
and they become an idol for all these people that are looking for, you know, looking for, for God, and instead they end up sending their money to this idol so that he can get a jet, so that he can fly around and collect more money from more people. And it's like it, it's, it's, I just like that connection with the idols that Satan made. I, I have a question. Did anybody ever point a finger at you and say liar? Mm -hmm. It's happening now. Hey, I'm not. If, if this goes political, I'm going to turn it off. But we're in an age right now where every day I read, or and I've quit watching the news. Uh, I'm tired of negativism. But every time I, I, I accidentally hear so and so just told a lie, his truth. What, what do they call it? The truth gauge. He's he's a liar. And I think, who in the world are you? I mean, you're a liar too. Uh, because sometimes, I mean, but we're in a very sad state now where uh, liars are being exposed. But is anybody saying so and so is a wonderful truth teller? No, no, we like reporting the negative aspects. And, and I want to become a happy truth teller. I don't want to be, you're a liar. What's up with that? So, yes. I was just thinking it would be such a wonderful world if we could just follow that one idea of never pointing out someone's faults without speaking of their truth or their strength or their positive. It's something we try to work on in schools, even with children, always say more positive than, than negative. But it, if it, we could just change that one thing, right. it would really change the world, I think. I had a great helper. I have to, I'm gonna, she's probably going to be embarrassed. Last night I was sitting at the uh, computer, Nancy came by, and I, I said, Nancy, do you know how I can get to this quote on uh, news search? Well, I didn't have my glasses on, the light was dark, and, I, and I'm not a great typist. So I'm typing, and Nancy says, well, if you're gonna do it, you gotta spell it correctly. That was one truth. <laughs> I wasn't getting anywhere because I, I was typing in the wrong word. She was a truth teller, and it was a humbling experience. And then my little friend here came up and said to me, oh, I can go on to the Kempton project, and I think I can find, and boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden she said, there it is. And indeed, uh, it was what I was looking for. And so she was very, very instrumental in me getting that quote. And I just want to read it again because it, it is absolutely superior. Uh, well, OK, I know what it is. It is not angelic to point out one's fault unless we're willing to, at the same time, point out something good. And so I, I want us to be, OK, so you got faults. But you know what? On the other hand, you're very good at thus and thus. She was good at getting me on Kempton, knew exactly, how, and it was refreshing. I felt uplifted, and I was able to get the quote so that I could share it with you all. See? I was going to share one of the things I think about lying that, um, that is important for us, especially in the, in the church, um, I think a lot of the ills of the past or even of the present in the church is, is sharing the doctrines like God thus, I mean, God did say the Ten Commandments, but our interpretations, the way we preach about it is our own perception of the appearances of truth that we can see. And, and so I think the, that the fact that we've moved into a place of, of claiming our own voices and saying, I am this person and these, this is what I see, helps to shed light on it for each other. Um, and also helps us to step away from that danger of being the preacher who proclaims the truth as if we are the voice of God, um, because I don't believe that's ever the case. I think the voice of God comes through our speaking, but we never have the full picture. Yes, Marv. I was thinking about the little white lie, and um, you could ask me, how did you like, your le like my lecture, Martha? And I'd say, well, I loved it that we sang Jesus Loved Me. <laughs> you know, I would say that you, and that's not a lie. And, that's not, and I don't know how that, maybe I didn't, or maybe I did like your lecture, but I can say I loved it that we sang Jesus Loves Me. And I, and I think sometimes you don't always have to say a little white lie 
if you say something nice. I love the colors in your shirt, George. I might not like plaid at all. <laughs> And then I have one other thing. Um, you're talking about taking down the Ten Commandments, you know, and we still can keep that. Um, I was teaching Sunday school, and I was telling how important God was and how we keep God in our hearts every day, and no matter where we are, and how it can help us at school, because these are uh, young children. And one little girl immediately put up her hand and said, but we don't, we can't have God in schools. And I said, maybe they can't teach you about God. Maybe they say God's not there. But I said, every single minute God is with you. And he's right here. So don't worry. God is always there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trevor, you had your hand up. Following up on that, George Dole used to say, George, that certainly is a shirt. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, this has been fun. This is my last presentation. And I said to Susanna, I am so deeply appreciative of every year I get a nice little note from her saying, George, would you like to come and talk at Freiburg? And it makes my little light go on to be asked and to be able to come back to be with you all. Thank you.